when I was teaching English composition in Chiang Mai University, back when I was a lay person, I had a class that was mainly made up of social science majors. So we decided, as part of the class, to do analysis of social problems. And as I pointed out to the class, they already had in their own culture a really good way of approaching social problems, the same way that the Buddha approached the problem of suffering. You don't solve the problem at the symptoms, you solve it at the cause. You comprehend suffering, but you don't let go of the suffering, you let go of the cause, which is craving. Three kinds of craving. Craving for sensuality, craving for becoming, craving for non-becoming. So it's good to think about how we go about abandoning the cause of suffering. The Buddha gives a little bit of a hint. He says you have to find the location where does craving grow. And that's where you put it out. That's where you abandon it. And it grows in things like sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, our feelings around these things, our perceptions around these things, thoughts, acts of evaluation around these things even craving for craving by these things. So when you see that you're suffering, you first have to figure out, okay, what is the suffering itself? This is why you have to comprehend it. You see that it's at the clinging to the five aggregates. And the way we cling to the five aggregates seems to have a lot of reality. In fact, much of our sense of reality operates around that. We cling in terms of sensuality. Then we use the aggregates for fantasizing about sensual pleasures. And then, of course, there's the, the pleasure itself that we're focused on. Then there are views about the world, that this is how the world works, kind of the reality principle. And then our views about what you should do within that world and the sense of who you are in that world to find that pleasure. And as you can see, all of these things are the raw materials for a state of becoming. It centers around a desire for a particular pleasure, and there's a world in which that pleasure exists. And you're the person in that world, and you have to figure out what are the steps that you're going to do in order to get what you want. All of that is suffering. It's really ironic, right, where we think we're gaining pleasure, gaining satisfaction. The Buddha said that's where the suffering is. So you have to ask yourself, okay, what's the clinging there? Which particular type of clinging are you engaging in that's causing you to suffer? Sometimes it's one or not of the four, sometimes it's all four together. And then you have to ask yourself, well, what would cause you to crave that? Of course, the idea that you're going to find satisfaction there. But where is that sense of satisfaction? Is it in the sight, the sound, the smell, taste, tactile sensation? Is it in the, the feelings that arise at, those, at the senses? Is it is in, in your perception around those things? And the perception of what? The perception of the object, the perception of yourself. Having that object. This is a principle that's used a lot in advertising. Years back there was a commercial for the BMW Chill. This guy comes up to a rooftop of a car garage, and there in the midst of all these old chalapis he's got his beautiful BMW, and he just shivers with a real frizzle. And you want to shoot the guy. But there are people who buy their BMW because of that, just because it makes them feel good, better than other people. So the desire is not focused on the BMW. It's focused on the, the chill, the feeling, that story that you can tell yourself about how you have the money and how you have the good taste in cars, that kind of thing. 
And then there's just craving for craving. As Buddha said, we go through life with craving as our friend. We feel it's going to provide us satisfaction, so we crave more of it. When you find yourself suffering about something, say it's physical illness situation in, in society, situation in your home, you have to ask yourself exactly where is your craving focused. Once you figure out what you're clinging to, where is the desire? As we said, the main desires will come in terms of sensuality, your fascination with thinking about sensual pleasures and planning for sensual pleasures. That's when you're planning a meal or planning to go to a restaurant and asking yourself, well, what dishes am I going to order today? And you run through the various options. And a lot of the pleasure in, in the food is actually in that, running through the options and your associations with different kinds of food. Then there's the craving for becoming, wanting to take a role in the world where that pleasure is found. And there's craving for non-becoming. Once you've taken on that role, you decide you don't like it. You want it to be destroyed. Now these three forms of craving come on really strong at the time of death. If you're in pain, well, you'll be thinking about the central pleasures you want, the central pleasure you don't have but you would like to have. And one of your ways of escaping the pain is to think about different central pleasures. And you don't want that ability to think about central pleasure to be taken away from you. Or you're afraid of death that you're just going to be annihilated. And so you're willing to latch onto any opportunity to continue becoming. Or maybe just looking back on your life, you feel that it's just been a, a lot of pain for nothing. I had a student one time who was, one night during his meditation, was able to remember ten lifetimes. And at the end of each lifetime, it was always, oh, the suffering, oh, the suffering. And often in a case like that, all you can think about is, well, how, wouldn't it be good just to have everything just snuffed out? This craving for non-becoming, which, as the Buddha said, is close to dispassion, but it actually leads to more becoming, because you have a perception about how much you would like that, and you latch on to that perception. Then you actually create a new becoming around that perception. So these are the desires you've got to watch out for that can cause suffering. And this is, doesn't mean that all desire is bad. After all, the desire to abandon unskillful qualities, the desire to develop skillful qualities is part of the path. Sometimes you hear that the craving that causes suffering is the craving for things to be other than they are. The idea being that if you simply accept things as they are, you'll be okay. But as craving is based on our experience that the things we want will sometimes come true. So it's not the case we just have to accept whatever's coming up and not want it to be different. The question is, what desires for change will be actually useful for putting an end to suffering? Which ones will just cause more suffering? And of course, there is some suffering on the path. It's a painful path sometimes, but it's pain that has a purpose. It's not like the pain that just goes into more and more craving for becoming, non-becoming, craving for sensuality. And the pain that comes from that it doesn't serve a purpose. But a purpose is served when you realize, okay, I'm engaging in unskillful qualities here. And you start looking at them and saying, well, what's the attraction? First of all, where is the attraction and why is it attractive? Are you attracted to the idea of just craving itself? Or are you attracted to a particular perception about you or the object you want or the state of being you want? Or a particular narrative? The 
that that's where you're going. You're going the wrong place. You focus your desires on qualities of mind that will get you out. Mindfulness, alertness, ardency, concentration, discernment. These are all good things to desire. That kind of change is, or that kind of desire for change, is actually part of the path. So look to see where the suffering is and why you would desire it. We don't think we desire suffering, but that's what the Buddha says. And that's what's so ironic about what he says. Precisely where you think you're going to find satisfaction is where you're actually clinging and causing yourself suffering. And you have to look at, well, why would I crave that? Because you don't see clearly what's going on. This is why we have to meditate. And this is why the path is the path to the end of craving. You get the mind still, and you can start seeing these things in action. As I was saying last night, as you practice concentration, you get a better, better sense of the aggregates and a better sense of the different operations that go into creating a thought, creating a thought world. And you get have a chance to see precisely where you are attracted to something, because otherwise it's a blur. John Cha's images of falling from a limb on a very tall tree. And you go past each of these individual limbs, but you can't say, oh, that's that limb and that's that limb, because you're falling so fast. As you get the mind into concentration, things begin to slow down. And you can actually see the steps. It's like floating down from the tree, and you say, oh, there's that limb, and then there's that limb, and then there's that one. And you can see precisely, oh, this is where my craving is focused. And when you see where it's really focused, you can often see this is pretty dumb. And John Swett would often say that when the Buddha talks about ignorance. He said it's a fancy word for stupidity. We're really stupid about our way of, stupid in our way of going for, for pleasure. Actually creating suffering out of what we think is where pleasure is going to be found. So try to get the mind as still as you can so you can observe these things. It's one thing to talk about them and hear about them mapped out, but it's when you can actually look and see, okay, this is where the craving is, that's where the clinging was, this is how the craving causes that clinging, how it causes you to cling to sensuality, how it causes you to cling to views or habits and practices, or to sense of yourself. And you can see through it and see that it's not worth it. Again, this is all about value judgments. It's another strange teaching you sometimes hear is that the Buddha doesn't want you to engage in value judgments, just accept things as they are. But if the teaching was all about acceptance, it wouldn't be the teaching it is. Yes, you do have to accept the way things are, but then you also have to accept the fact that you can change the way things are. You can manipulate this pattern of cause and effect that the Buddha discovered. And you can manipulate it for the sake of putting an end to your suffering. That's what the path is all about, why it's something that you develop. So work on the developing so you can let go of the craving, because that's where the the problem originates, and that's where it's going to be solved.